before it was necessarily, you know, popular or the quote unquote thing to do. And I, I remember, you know, just peeping your videos and watching them. I think I'm going to say at least maybe even 10 years ago. Right. Um, and, you know, uh, just hearing your bills and and, you know, there were there were it was always dope to hear your perspective on, you know, different aspects of the lessons or the history. Um, what made you say, even whenever, like I said, it wasn't popular, it wasn't necessarily the thing to do. What made you hop into that uh, YouTube space, uh, you know, 10, 11, 12 years ago uh, and, and you know, educate the people that way? Yeah. Um, so prior to me even blogging or doing videos, I was writing articles. So that goes back into like the, like Y2K time, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Early, like late nineties, mm -hmm. I was writing for a publication out in the UK. I was also writing articles for the 5% of newspaper from time to time. I would uh, send articles there and I was writing also for publications locally and regionally. And my main focus was more social commentary. So, you know, as scientists of life, we're always studying something and, and, and creatively we need an outlet in order yes. to express that knowledge and wisdom so that we could share and impart that understanding. True. And I started out doing that first, like writing articles. And then eventually I created my own blog space back in like 2005. And to this day, I've still been consistently writing articles for that, I think I've written mm -hmm. over 350 something articles just on that space alone. Right. And through that, I eventually got involved in recording videos. And the reason that I even did it was to just document the things that I was actually doing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was never from the perspective of being like a talking head, mm -hmm. sharing my thoughts or ideas about things. It was directly related to something that I was actually doing. So a lot of my early videos, I'm in the vehicle all the time because I'm all right. in transit. Right. Either going to a program or going to a project or an initiative. And when I would have a thought in the midst of that, I would share it. Right. So throughout those years, I've been able to consistently create content because it was always based upon something that I'm actually doing. So I never run out of content. Right, and right. That is one of the, the things that I think a lot of people today don't realize that you have to really have a life that's worth living, mm -hmm. that is authentic, and that represents actionable items, things that you're literally doing. Mm -hmm. And through that, you can utilize your digital platform to document that work, because if you're doing it that way, you would never have to chase, chase ambulances. You right. know, you see people... And over the last few years, you see a, a whole genre of reaction videos. Yep, yep. You know what I'm the, saying? That's, like, that's the like most least creative uh, thing that you can do is create a video off of somebody else's video, and I'm just reacting to it. But I see that a lot. Yeah, yeah, and 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 things like that have a sad birth record to it because mm -hmm. it's not a direct representation of how you're actually living right you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. um, i was thinking about this the other day and I, I mentioned it to you you had posted something about a week ago and i commented and i said that if i look back at what i've if i've looked back over over some of the content that i've created over the years whether that's a project a program an initiative a video a book that I've written, an album that I've created, or any of those things mm -hmm. that are tangible, mm -hmm. I could literally share some project, program, or initiative every day for the next five years. Wow. Right, right. Without right. ever repeating anything throughout a seven day period. And that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. You know what I'm saying? And, and I wouldn't be able to do that mm -hmm. if it wasn't something that I was actually living each and every day. Right. You know? so, right. So when I entered this digital space, it was just only to, to document things that I was doing and to share it with others so that others can utilize this in a practical way and implement it in the various different locations where they are. Right. And over the years of creating that space, I also got a lot of opportunities to 
collaborate with various different people or organizations or businesses mm-hmm. and became somewhat of a subject matter expert related to the 5%. So if there's like any kind of national or international news that's related to the 5%, the national or international press reaches out to me. I'm one of the primary contacts just by virtue of the digital footprint that I've created over the years. And that's nothing I never set out to do or the a goal. That's some shit that I've had to just accept and deal with. <laughs> right. A lot of people don't realize the the level of expectation that comes along with that responsibility. Mm-hmm. So I teach sixth grade right now. Um, I also help and support a second grade class um, at an elementary school, and I do that every day. Right. Um, in the middle of the day, I could get an email from. New York state asking me for content for something. And I, I may need to get it to them within the next 72 hours. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I'm constantly getting like, yeah, that's a lot of pressure. (laughs) You know what I mean? So, so that, you know, so creating that, that, that digital space. One thing that I always encourage people to do is if you're going to start doing, um, videos or if you're going to start writing articles or something like that you have to be clear on the amount of time that you're willing to allocate to doing something like that right i I started writing articles back in 2005 on my own space i was writing articles before that but when i got to 2005 and i said i wanted to create my own space and to write articles consistently i knew at that time that I could commit to publishing at least two articles a month. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to consistently do that from 2005 all the way to today. You know what I'm saying? Because I was, I was honest about my time and consistent about it. You know, Mm -hmm. a lot of times people run into stuff and they wrote, really don't think about it. Like, yo, you're going to be doing this in the next five years. Right. Right. Plan ahead. And that's how you build your audience. And it's just like with any type of, program that you see on television you know if if something that's really good because a lot of people have a lot of great ideas mm-hmm. if it comes on at eight o'clock on wednesday evening <laughs> it needs to come on at eight o'clock exactly. next wednesday too because exactly. you mess around and it be spotty and all this other stuff you're gonna lose your audience and frustrate people too mm-hmm. some people you know they won't even tune in because they're like damn i don't know when they're gonna do something else and this was real great right they're not going you know right. No, that's that's real, God, because it's it's uh, you have to have. Uh, first off, you it's, it's definitely like a second job. It can be, you know what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> you you have to put in, you know, the time. Um, whether you're editing your stuff, and you know, it's just a lot that goes into it. Also, you're right. Consistency is one of the most important things because if, like, like you said, if it comes out Wednesday. People are on at eight o'clock. People are going to expect it to come out on Wednesday at eight o'clock, every Wednesday at eight o'clock, right? And so, regardless to what you may have going on in your personal life or if you or at your job, you still have to make time and commit that time in order to give that uh, your other job, you know, some uh, uh, that time that it needs in order for you to be able to keep putting out. Um, Keep putting out videos. And um, speaking of uh, videos, you were recently in a documentary hosted by Samuel L. Jackson uh, called Enslaved, man. Um, really, really dope. Um, if you can kind of build, or like, how did, how did you even get that spot? And what are some of the things that you learned during that whole process and, and everything like that? Yes, G. So, so I'm going uh, I'm to share this, too, about the work that you've been doing as well in terms of creating uh, this space for mm-hmm. people to be able to share a variety of different voices related to the science of everything in life. Right. The more you consistently do this, the more you create that digital footprint where you become a subject matter expert in this area of expertise or mm-hmm. this niche that mm-hmm. others are not an, uh, a, a, an expert in. Mm-hmm. And people who are connected to various different companies or institutions or or other different organizations search for people who are subject matter experts in specific niches because you know that is a person that 
has value in terms of what they're actually doing. Mm -hmm. And because I started to do, you know, this type of work digitally for a while, um, the, one of the first opportunities that I had was back in like the, maybe the mid 2000s or something like that. I worked as a, a program consultant for the History Channel uh, <laughs> series, uh, Gangland, and they were doing an a, a episode on a gang called the Hidden Valley Kings, mm -hmm. in Charlotte, North Carolina. And they okay. reached out to me through YouTube because they saw my content. Wow. And brought wow. me in just based upon being a subject matter expert in that capacity. Right. So over the years, I've had many other different opportunities. I've worked as a consultant for different celebrities and stuff. And it's like non disclosure agreement yeah. that I, I signed <laughs> with them and stuff. But it's funny as hell because there's <laughs> been times where it'll be a celebrity on television or something uh -huh. <laughs> saying, or issuing a, a, a public statement that I wrote for them right. Like, <laughs> right, right. like hours ago. Wow. And you're sitting right next to me, just sitting there listening to it. And I won't say shit. I just look like, <laughs> yep. you know <laughs> but, but I've gotten those type of opportunities. And, you know, also because of my, my uh, lineage, I'm yep. connected to Josiah Henson, who was a forerunner of the Underground Railroad. Definitely. And he is the model that, Harriet Beecher Stowe used for her famous novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, mm -hmm. because that is a part of my ancestry. That is also something that people seek out to learn more about and to connect me to some of their projects. And the Enslaved docuseries is one of those opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, I also worked um, on another uh, IMAX film called Into America's Wild that's narrated by Morgan Freeman. And they, what is that about? They, um, it's about different uh, paths or journeys of people around the United States. So because it's an IMAX film, mm -hmm. it, it showcases like large screen imagery of various different places and landscapes mm -hmm. of this country. So there were two indigenous people who were the, the host, Ariel Tweedo mm -hmm. and John Harrington, who was the first indigenous person who was a, a astronaut. And wow. They host this IMAX film and they came here to my city and, you know, I taught them about some of the, the history of the Underground Railroad here in my city. Mm -hmm. So and then also my after school program, I got them incorporated into the project as well. And they paid them to be on film. And oh. that was that was dope for them to experience that the first time in their life, you know? Yeah. yeah. Real uh, dope. So opportunities like that just started to come based upon the things that they see me doing. Now, keep in mind, everything that I'm sharing is based upon things that I'm actually doing. So I'm not just talking. Mm -hmm. These are things that you can go and research. If I talk about how I'm a human rights commissioner here in my city, you can contact my city hall. <laughs> and find out. See right. I'm a, a human rights commissioner here and what time we meet mm -hmm. monthly so that you could attend the meeting. Right. You know, with us, me and my other human rights commissioners, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. so when when companies especially and institutions want to create projects or programs and initiatives, if they want it to be authentic and genuine, they make sure that they bring people in who are authentic and genuine, who check out if they did any kind of background research and, and things along those lines, because you also add value. Right. Projects, you know, so please support and share with your networks our Atlanta school renovation project. Through a recently acquired property here in the city of Niagara Falls, New York, we are doing renovations to establish an early childhood learning center and after school program for youth in our city. Despite students of color representing more than half the student population in this country, black men represent less than 2% of that teacher workforce. So as a black educator, my voice and presence within the lives of children is critical to combating family dysfunction, juvenile delinquency, and creating an inclusive workforce that ensures that all of our nation's students receive a quality culturally enriched education which consists of various projects, programs, and initiatives such as this cool animation series. This is not simply my profession. It is also my passion and my purpose. 
we would really appreciate your support and sharing this initiative with your networks. Thank you.